good afternoon ladies and gentlemen respected keynote speaker respected authors participant and session chair welcome to the international conference on science and contemporary technologies 2021 organized by bangladesh university of business and technology i dr m firoz mida associate professor and chairman department of computer science and engineering I am the coordinator of today's keynote session of security and privacy for the Internet of Things. Keynote speaker is Dr. Biplav Shikdar, Vice Dean, Graduate Program, National University, Singapore. Now, I would like to introduce our Honorable Session Chair, uh, Dr. Mohammed Moshul Hawk, Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Dean. Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Chuet, Chair, IEEE Bangladesh Section, Senior Member, IEEE, IEEE RAS, IEEE SPS, and IEEE CS, IEEE WIE, Director, Sheikh Kamal IT Business Incubator, in Chuet, Founding Director, Chuet NLP Lab, his research interest, human robot, computer interaction, computer vision, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing. And here, to, this session would be continued from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And keynote session, uh, keynote speaker will uh, give his, deliver his speech, uh, 45 minutes, and last 15 minutes would be the uh, discussion and photo session. Now I would like to request our honorable session chair to conduct the session. Please, session chair. Thank you so much for your nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to keynote session. It is my privilege to introduce honorable speaker of the session, Dr. Biplop Shikdar. Biplop Shikdar is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the National University of Singapore, where he also served as a vice dean in the Faculty of Engineering received the BTEC degree in electronics and communication engineering from Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, India in 1996, MTech degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in 1998, and PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Troy, New York, USA in 2001. He was an Eastern professor from 2001 uh, to 2007, an associate professor from 2007 to 2013 in the Department of Electrical, Computer, and System Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute from 2001 to 2013. He is a recipient of the NSF Career Award, An Chin Chung Fellowship from NTU Singapore, Japan Society for Promotion of Science Fellowship and the Leib Erickson Fellowship from Research Council of Norway. His research interests include IoT and cyber physical system security, network security, and network performance evaluation. Dr. Shikdar is a member of ETA Kappa Nu and Tau Beta Pi. He served as an associate editor for the IEEE Transaction and Communication from 2007 to 2012 an associate editor for the IEEE transaction on mobile computing from 2014 to 2017. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Biplav Shikdar and request to hand over the session. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Hawk, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Professor Feroz. So let me get started here. Okay. So I hope you can see my screen. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So th thank you again. Uh, you know, for me, mm, it's always uh, very uh, happy and uh, 
uh, emotional thing when I uh, give a talk in a university in Bangladesh uh, because uh, my both my parents were actually born there. <laughs> my, my mother is from Dhaka. Uh, my father is from Khulna. Anyway, so <clears throat> I think of that as uh, sort of my homeland also. Okay, so uh, I'll talk about uh, security and privacy for Internet of Things. So just to uh, get us started here, you know, so it's been about 52 years since we have the Internet. And when the Internet started in 1969, uh, there were just four computers. Right? And all of these were sort of in the west coast of the United States. So there was one in uh, Los Angeles. SRI is in uh, San near San Francisco, there's one in Santa Barbara, and this is in Utah. And you know, back in the day, people didn't have their own uh, laptops or personal computers. And uh, you know, a big organization or, or university may have its own mainframe computer. And what people would do is they would remotely log into this mainframe computer to do, you know, submit their jobs and whatever. And the way you would log into this remote computer is you would use a program, something called Telnet and all those things. But the first thing is you would have to say, what's your login ID and then your password, right? So you would type like login, L-O-G-I-N, right? And then you would send it over the network and then you would log in. So in this case, they sent, the, they typed L, it was okay. O was also okay. But when they typed G, the whole thing crashed, right? So the first things ever sent on the internet was LO, sorry, and uh, it crashed at G. And from there, you know, starting from such humble beginnings, we have a, uh, you know, this one shows a very US centric view of uh, how the number of nodes in the, in the internet evolved over time. This is still 80s, 70s and 80s. And uh, back in the 70s and 80s, most of the users of these networks were mainly people in academia or, or maybe in the military or some research labs and so on. So, so regular people like you and I, we, we probably wouldn't be using the internet. Right? And in the 70s, some of the common applications, I was just talking about Telnet for remote login. Uh, in, in the early 70s, for example, 73, uh, three fourths of the, all the traffic carried in the network was email. Uh, file transfers over the network, something called FTP was quite popular. And, you know, right now we are doing this over Zoom. And, you know, you are probably quite familiar with WhatsApp and uh, applications like that. So they're essentially network voice protocols. So this is also has a very rich history of 30 years, 40 years, and so on. Uh, the thing that changed the use of the internet and the users of the internet from people in researchers in academia or military was in the late 80s, early 90s, when a gentleman by the name of uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he invented a protocol called HTTP. Right? And this started the, the, you know, the popularity of World Wide Web. And what HTTP did was it made it very easy to find information and then to visualize or download that information. Uh, before the internet, as we know it, if you needed some information, you had to you know, either own the book or you had to go to a library, or you had to ask somebody who, who, who knew that thing. But now anything you wanna know, you just go to the web. And you know, these days, Google is the most popular search engine. So you go to Google and you search and then you, you have that information in, in, in front of you, right? So that really has changed the way we, we, we do things. And it's not just access to the information, the ability to, to uh, you know, uh, access servers and access information anywhere has led to a large number of new applications such as e-commerce, social media, the sharing economy and so on, right? So, so, this, so this is another way of visualizing the same thing. Uh, so when, in the early 90s, what we had was the internet of co content. And this is when HTTP came out and people started using quote unquote the internet. And what most people were using the internet back then, maybe you know, accessing basic information, maybe some entertainment, some news programs and, and, uh, and so on. Right? Now that changed maybe in the late 1990s or early 2000s. 
when rather than just accessing information, now we use the information for something, either for uh, you know, uh, increasing your productivity or buying and selling things. So this is when companies such as Amazon, eBay, they became popular. And in the mid 2000s, it was the internet of people and that's where social media became popular. So things like Skype, Facebook, YouTube, uh, they, they started becoming popular. Right? But across all of this, right, all these three generations, internet of content, services, or people, what you will see is that, uh, you know, when you're, using, when you're using a network-based service, there's usually two endpoints, a source and a destination, or a client and a server, and things like that. But in all of these three, at least one of the endpoints of the network was a human. It's a human who sends an email and a human who reads the email, right? If you're thinking of Amazon or eBay, it's a human who's, who's connecting to the server and then looking at what are the things on sale. If you're looking at Facebook or YouTube, it's a human who uploads a post or a video or a picture to the server. And sometime later, maybe it's a human who accesses that server to watch that video. Now what we are is we are in the era of Internet of Things. And in this case, what has happened is we have removed the human from the loop. So now our machines are smart enough to decide when they want to transfer data, how they want to process the data, how they want to deal with the data, and then maybe take action based on the data. Right? I'll just give you an example, maybe from uh, you know power grids. So we all have, we all we are all consuming electricity, and then uh, in 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 your in Bangladesh or or in Singapore, there is usually a government body who who provides electricity. Right? And since we consume the electricity at the end of the month, uh, we should also pay for that electricity. Right? And in order to pay for that electricity, we have a meter at home. And in most cases, and traditionally what would happen is uh, somebody from the electric uh, company or the, 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 the state electric commission, whatever it is, right? Uh, they would come to your home at the end of the month. They will look at the meter reading. And then some days later, you would get a bill by, by post. Okay. So this serves the functionality of uh, you know, charging you for how much you have consumed. But if you look at the operation of the electric grid, the grid operator has to think, how much should I generate today? And it's not just the day, it's actually the, the, the power consumption varies every hour, every half an hour. And you can imagine, right? So, so in, in, in most countries, uh, factories and industry would be a big consumer of electricity, but they only operate during the day. Factories are off during the night. So that power consumption changes. And if you think about your own home, uh, power consumption will go up at night because the lights are on and maybe you're watching TV at night and then things like that, right? So power consumption varies with time. So if you're the grid operator, you have to decide how much you should be generating. But if I know how much people are consuming, then it's much more easier for me to decide how much I generate. And that's where smart meters come in, right? So the idea about a smart meter is that, so there'll be a meter at your home, but it will have internet connection. And then every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, whatever you want, uh, the meter can send, a, send the reading back to the control station. And if I get the meter readings from everybody in Bangladesh or everybody in Dhaka or everybody in Singapore, then I know how much people are consuming. And then maybe I can run a machine learning model or some other model that can predict how much energy will be consumed in the next one hour. And then I can ramp up or ramp down my generation accordingly. Right? And in this case, the meter can send the data automatically. No human needs to be involved. This meter data can be processed automatically. No human needs to be involved and my algorithms can decide on their own whether my generation should go up or down. Again, no human needs to be involved. And by doing this, I can increase the efficiency of my grid. I can reduce you know, wastage of power, or I can also you know, prevent under-generation of power, which may lead to 
uh, load shedding or blackout, some things like that. And this is just an example of how IoT can play a play role. And uh, you know, there are many different applications of IoT. There could be applications in smart city, the next generation of industry, which is industry 4.0. I just gave you the example of smart energy and then so on. And so there are all these different things. And if you look at how people project the importance of IoT in the future, uh, you know, IoT is supposed to be, is expected to be one of the top three drivers of industry and, you know, a lot of potential for, for uh, business and generating revenue and things like that. Now, all of this is good, right? We see a lot of adoption of IoT technologies in different industries. Uh, we also see a lot of potential for market and so on. Uh, but then uh, everything is not so rosy. There are certain things we need to worry about. And one of the big concerns here is security, right? And there have been many incidents that have happened over the last few years, last 10 years. And then if you are the, let's say the CEO of a company or the managing director of a company, and you're thinking whether you should be employing IoT based technologies in your, in your organization or not. And then if you hear that there are security concerns, then you'll be, you'll rethink, you'll think, do I really care about, will, Will the things such as increased efficiency offset the, the security concerns? Then you'll, you'll, you'll think like that, right? And there are many well-publicized security incidents that have happened. And this is probably one of the most, uh, you know, well-advertised um, ones or one pe most people are aware of. So this is something that happened in Iran. And this is a nuclear power reactor in, in Iran. And this nuclear power reactor got infected by a virus. And what that did that as a result is, you know, when, when you have a nuclear reactor, what you have to do is you have to enrich uranium, okay? And to enrich that uranium, what you do is you need to separate the heavy uranium from the light uranium, and usually do it by using centrifuge. And the malware in this case, the virus, it started spinning the centrifuges at a very, very high speed. And as a result, after some time, they all uh, uh, broke down and they were destroyed. Uh, this is 2015 and 16. And in this, at the time, you know, Russia and Ukraine were having some kind of a fight over a, a region of Ukraine called Crimea. And then Russian hackers got into the Ukrainian power grid. And then they shut down the Ukrainian power grid in December. And the reason I bring out December is, you know, uh, winters are really cold in Ukraine, and uh, a lot of people use electricity for heating up their house. So if there is no power, then you have no heat, and then it's it's really bad. So so yeah, that was one. And increasingly, we see a lot of. Uh, oops, sorry, I, I I pressed the wrong thing. Uh, increasingly, you see a lot of uh, ransomware attacks, and what happens in a ransomware attack is the an attacker will come in and they will encrypt all your files. And then you don't have any access to your files. So then they will, the attacker will say, give me some money and then I'll give you the password for password for decrypting the file. And this is one example from USA, example from USA where, uh, you know, the city in Michigan, Lansing is a city in Michigan. Uh, so Michigan's board of water and lighting, they got uh, hacked and all their files were compromised and they had to pay money to get this back. And then the last example is from Saudi Arabia. So Saudi, Ara Saudi Aramco is, a, is, a, is, a, is actually the biggest oil producing company in the world. And about five, six, uh, seven or eight years back, they got hacked by some um, organization. And uh, what they were doing is, you know, your computer has a hard disk. And this particular malware would crash your hard disks. So if your hard disk crashes, you have no access to your data and you cannot boot up your computer and so on. So, so this is another example. Now the examples on this particular slide, these four, these are bit industrial in nature. So they're targeting uh, IoT installations in, in big industries. How about IoT devices that you may have in your home, right? So common IoT devices that we may have at our home may be things like, uh, you know, temperature sensors, video cameras, and so on, right? So two, three years back, there was a denial of service attack launched using IoT devices that people have in their home. 
And for those of you who are not familiar with denial of service, uh, the idea is, so let's say you have a server, maybe you have a web server, and uh, you uh, maybe you sell something through your web service, through your website, and you expect your customers to come to your web server and then download your web page and buy and sell, right? Now, what I'll do is I will send so much traffic to your data, to, to your web server, that your regular customers will not have any bandwidth to come in. That's one way. Or I will send so much to so many connections, connection requests to your web server that it will be busy just serving my connection and I'm not buying or selling anything from you. So when the legitimate customers come in, they have no bandwidth to get in, right? So, so, so your CPU has no resources available to serve those customers. Right? So that would be one example of, uh, you know, that's how uh, denial of service attacks are usually uh, made. And in this case, uh, people, the, the hackers, uh, they took over a large number of IoT devices, and then they used these IoT devices to launch a denial of service attack. And in this case, they were targeting a company called DIN. And what DIN does is it provides DNS services. Again, what's a DNS service? So for us humans, it's much easier for us to remember things like www.google.com, or www.amazon.com. Uh, you know, these are names that we can remember. Uh, but the internet doesn't really work on names like that. We need IP addresses. So IP addresses are usually 32-bit binary numbers or 128-bit binary numbers. So something like www, uh, let's say google.com. Uh, for us, that will be the domain name which we can remember easily. Uh, so we may type www.google.com in our web browser and hit enter, but this needs to be translated to an IP address such as 127.1.5.9, something like that. And then ultimately your TCP connection will be open using this IP address. So we can't remember numbers like this. It's very difficult for us to remember as humans, right? You may remember one or two, but you will definitely not remember hundreds of these. So that's where DNS comes in, and DNS does the translation between the host name and IP address. And there are dedicated servers who will do this translation for you. But now if I launch a denial of service attack on this DNS server, so it's getting so much traffic that now if you want to do the translation, you send a request, but the server has no resources available for doing the translation for you. So essentially the problem now is then there'll be no translation and you cannot go to your website. So that's how they attack you know, this, right? And I'll just walk you through the attack process. So what they would do is, so the attackers would do is they would look for video cameras. Why video cameras? Because video cameras can generate a lot of data, right? So they would hack into a video camera and instead of sending the video to you, they would direct the video to, for example, whatever server they want to attack. So then this server will get so much traffic that you know its, its link will be exhausted and it will not be able to service any, any legitimate customers. So in this case, uh, the way the attackers were working is they would first get into a victim and then they would use this victim to search for other potential victims in the same network. And once they find other cameras and other things, then they would try to get into that camera. How? Usually, you know, if you have a webcam, you can usually remotely log into that, usually using some username and password. So then they would try to guess this username and password. So they would try to brute force their way in. And if they find a new victim, they will send the report back to a report server. So all of these things are owned by the attacker. And periodically, what the attacker would do is, the attacker has a command and control server and it will check, are there any new victims available? If there are new victims available, now it's time to infect them with the malware. So the command and control server will send a command to a loader, and then the loader will actually now send them real malicious binary to the victim. So now this camera is also part of my network. So I'm the attacker, I had this one, now I have this. And by recruiting more and more of this, now I'll build up a botnet. 
And finally, when the day comes that I want to attack, let's say then, I will send an attack command. And now this video camera will send its video feed here. This video camera will send a video feed here, somebody else. I will usually have thousands of these video cameras. They will all send their data to this target server. And then the target server will be overwhelmed with this kind of traffic. So now let's, so that's how we understand how this can be done, but let's see how we actually could do this brute force into this video camera. It turns out that many of your IoT devices, such as webcams and so on, they're pretty cheap. You know, if these devices are very expensive, then most likely I will not buy. Right? And and if you if you try to manufacture cheap things, usually you also try to minimize your cost. And in many of these, what happens is you know uh, the username and password are usually hard coded into the device firmware. And for this particular video camera. The username was root and the password is XC3511. So if I have a video camera like this particular manufacturer, I know that the username is root and the password is this. And every other camera that was manufactured by this company has the same username and the same password. So if I now know that you have also bought a similar camera, you have bought the same camera from the same manufacturer, then I know how to get into your camera because I know the username and password. And there are lots of these things called dictionaries, which are available and they have common username and common password. And sometimes users are also to blame. Many times, you know, many of us, we would select a username as, you know, username and then password might be one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D. So these are very, very easy to guess. So these are common problems, right? And I was giving you some examples and there are lots of other examples where people have come in and then they have attacked IoT devices and then things like that, right? So, so, you know, people have hacked into baby monitors, they have hacked into cars and taken over your car while you're driving and lots of other examples like that, right? So hopefully in this part of my talk, I've given you some idea about how IoT security can, is important. So now let's switch a little bit and see what we can do to secure IoT. Right? So when it comes to security for computer systems, usually we look at three things. Uh, the CIA, right? The confidentiality, integrity, and authentication or availability. Right? So confidentiality says, if I am sending a message on the network, only the receiver should be able to know what's written in that message. So even if you're able to get a copy of that message, you should not be able to understand what's written in there. How do we do it? Usually by using encryption. Right? If I encrypt a message, uh, a third party should not be able to understand what's written in that message. The next is integrity. Integrity says that if I send a message on the network, and let's say somebody modifies that message, they change some part of the message, it should not be possible. Or even if they're able to change the message, if, if they change it, I should be able to detect that the message has been changed. Right? So then I know that the, the contents of the message, they are incorrect and I should ignore them. And the last one is authentication. So this is basically proving who you are. Right? So for example, when you access your email, you, you prove your identity by giving your username and password. So these, these are things we commonly do for computer-based systems. So they are also applicable for IoT, no change. But there are some small differences. So when we do the CIA for our laptops or our phones and so on, uh, there are a few assumptions. So, so you know, our laptops or our smartphones, uh, they're actually quite powerful computing devices. The processor they have is usually powerful. Uh, they may have a reasonably good amount of memory. Uh, they have, they are plugged in, so they have lots of power. Or even a phone, it may not be plugged in, but then you know I can always charge it at the evening when I go home, or I can. It's easy to charge a smartphone. But when it comes to IoT devices, these assumptions are not valid anymore. If you have a small IoT sensor, maybe it's measuring the temperature of your room. 
uh, that has a small pencil battery, which is supposed to last five years or something, right? So, so you're not going to go and charge it every time. And it doesn't have an Intel or an AMD microprocessor. It probably has a very simple microcontroller in there. So the kind of algorithms that you can use for, uh, let's say you have an encryption algorithm that you use in your laptop, you really cannot use it for your IoT device. If you use it, a couple of problems, maybe your processor is not smart fast enough or capable enough of doing it, or even if it is, it's going to draw a lot of battery and your IoT device will not last very long, right? So those are things we need to worry about, right? So, so a security protocol for IoT has to be lightweight comparatively. There are other things which we worry about with IoT and that is privacy, right? I'll give you an example here about privacy. So this one that you see, this is a smart garbage bin or a trash can. And these were deployed in London a few years ago. And the idea is that uh, this trash can has a Wi-Fi and a Bluetooth connection. And there are also sensors inside. So it knows how much, how full this is, right? So if it is not full, then you don't have to come and empty it. And if it is full, it can send a signal so somebody can come or the truck can come and empty it, right? So, so it helps with efficiency and make sure, uh, you know, things are clean and other things. But then this also had a Bluetooth radio. And when Bluetooth runs, and if you're running it in a promiscuous mode, what it does is it keeps scanning to see if there are other Bluetooth devices in the neighborhood or not. And if you are walking by and your phone has Bluetooth enabled, then it will know, it will pair up with your, with your phone and it can log your MAC address. And imagine that uh, these uh, cans or uh, rubbish or, or trash cans, they are deployed every few hundred meters when, along the streets. So while you're walking, every time you pass by one of these trash cans, it logs your MAC address. And then later on, I know where you were, which is the path you take, took, where you walked, and so on. Right? So then there's a, there's a privacy problem. You know, in, 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 in places like, let's say, India, Bangladesh, maybe we don't care so much about who knows where we walk, where we go. But then there are other places where such privacy may be a big concern, right? And ultimately, they had to take out these cans from the street. People made, you know, the, the government got worried about uh, privacy concerns and so on. And then there are other things like trust and ownership issues. Like your phone has a lot of sensors. You are generating data. For example, we use Google Maps to tell us how to go from point A to point B. It also tells us how much traffic is there in, in any particular area. So we get the service from Google, but we are also actually sending data back to Google. We are telling Google where we are, and if you're walking, Google knows where we went from, you know, how much time it took. That's how Google tells whether a part of a road is congested or not. So you generated the data. It was generated from your phone, but now you have given it to Google. Who is the real owner of this data? Is it you or is it Google? Right? Do you really trust Google to do the right thing with your data and it'll, that it'll never leak this data to anybody else? So, you know, as, as you have more and more senses with you, all these questions come up. And then the last thing is about physical security. With a phone or a laptop, the idea is that they will always be with me. But if you deploy an IoT device by the roadside, let's say you have a roadside sensor that monitors pollution level, or maybe it's looking at how many vehicles are going so you can do transportation control. You have deployed the sensor by the roadside. You don't deploy a policeman to sit by your sensor to protect it, right? If I know that you have deployed a sensor by the roadside, it's very easy for me to steal it, right? So I can steal your sensor and I take it with me. So that's the physical security part of your sensor. And so these, and that can also lead to security challenges and I'll come to that. And these are some of the reasons why IoT devices might be targeted a lot. So things like, you know, uh, devices are always on, so it makes it much more easy to be hacked into. Uh, IoT devices 
uh, they are supposed to be deployed in you know homes and and then regular people should be able to use it so you are all engineers and and uh, computer science or electrical engineers so you if i ask you to set up it has a lot of steps you may be able to do it but imagine your parents your mother or your father uh, they may not be engineers my mother is not an engineer for example if i ask her to set up an iot device uh, which has a lot of steps maybe if i ask her pick a username enter a username and you know she will give up she said i don't need this right so so usually manufacturers shy away from security in in the favor of usability and uh, you know one way i know if my laptop has been compromised and if it has been hacked is if it's if it becomes very slow if it runs very hot but with an iot device we usually don't do that right we deploy an iot device and we forget about it we don't interact with our iot devices but with a laptop or a desktop we interact every day so we have a better idea if if that gets hacked into right and there are many different vulnerabilities that iot devices have right i was just talking about stealing an iot device so if i steal an iot device i open it up i can see a pcb which looks sort of like this and here you can see that in the pcb there is a serial port which is open so what i can do is i can connect three wires here and i can read off the wire uh why is that important it is important because let's say you want this iot device to do authentication how do we do authentication as a human i do authentication by inputting the username and password how do i know what is my username and password i memorize it right i store it in my brain i remember it but with an iot device there is no human involved so there's nobody remembering the username and password for that iot device so where is that username and password for the iot device stored most likely in the memory right not most likely it's definitely in the memory of the device so if you have programmed your iot device with the username and password and you've stored it in the memory if i can connect wires like this to the serial port then i can use it to read the memory and see what's the username and password and even if there is no a uh, serial port like this i can desolder this chip and i can somehow uh, there it is possible for me to read off the chip right so there are all these vulnerabilities that come in and i just gave you an example when we were talking about that uh, denial of service attack many times iot devices come with very weak or hard coded username and passwords so that's a problem and it's not just the iot devices when you collect the data from these devices what do you do we usually interact with these using a web application most of the time right uh, are you really sure your mobile or web application is secure sometimes there are vulnerabilities in those also and uh, you know when you use when you browse the web you have two options you can use http or you can use https so https is the secure version it encrypts everything but then it's also slow and it consumes more uh, computational power at your device so most iot devices if they do they will not use the encrypted version of the protocol just to save on energy just to save on computation so that that also becomes problem and then you know most of the time they will not do security verification such as integrity checks and so on and if you have a device such as your laptop or your smartphone microsoft or apple or 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 you know google they will periodically if there is a vulnerability in the software they will periodically update the operating system or the firmware but if it's a small iot device manufacturer in some small company somewhere they don't care they will not update right and they will not be interested in repairing vulnerabilities and so on and then there can be physical error sorry physical vulnerabilities coding errors and things like that right? and these are some of the security challenges that i was already talking about right and one thing i want to highlight here is that you know uh, even though there are firewalls and antivirus software for your desktop computers and your smartphone uh, they are usually not available for iot devices so remote updates and patching of iot devices is is a big challenge all right so how do we go about securing this 
So, so, so the answer really is that everybody has a role to play here. So, you know, users have a role to play. Uh, the device vendors who are making these IoT devices, they have a role to play. You know, after you, the, the data is generated by the IoT device, it probably goes to a cloud-based platform somewhere, maybe Amazon Web Services. So they have a role to play. Uh, the, the developers of apps, the developers of platforms, they all have a role to play. And also the government has a big role to play because they are the ones who can make sure that uh, the device manufacturers put in security measures in place. And so so uh, only after everybody comes in and makes sure that you know we put in all of these things, then we can have security for IoT devices. So with this, uh, now I'll, I'll just switch gears a little bit. And now I'll, I'll focus on one specific security problem for IoT. And this is the physical security, right? And if you remember, physical security relates to the fact that, you know, uh, people can come in and easily steal my IoT device and so on. Uh, and, and again, the problem is that, you know, since IoT devices operate on their own and there is no human involved, so all of their security credentials, uh, you know, their secrets, their usernames and passwords, they need to be stored in the memory of the device. But if the device is stolen, then it's very easy for me to open up the device and then gain access to the memory and so on. Right? I was just showing you the example of, of how we can connect wires to the, to the physical ports that are in the, in, the, in the device and then read off the memory. And even if that's not possible, I can do other things like side channel attacks. So what people have shown is that by looking at the electromagnetic radiation that comes out of your, of your CPU, I can tell what is, the, what is the password of the key that you're using. So there are all these attacks that are possible. So then the question is that how can I address this problem? How can I make sure that my IoT devices can, let's say, uh, authenticate themselves? but I don't need to store anything in the memory of the device, right? So that's, that's the problem I want to solve. And the way we do this is by looking at the hardware properties of the devices. And what we want to look at, but what I mean by hardware pro security primitives is that, you know, if you think of what we use as humans to authenticate ourselves, right? So imagine, and I'm, I, I think you have some kind of an ID card in Bangladesh and we have that in, Singapore or in the US or in India, you know, so for example, if you come in, if you leave Bangladesh and then you come in and you, you come in through the, let's say the Dhaka airport, one of the things they will ask you to do probably is to put your fingerprints, right? So our fingerprints are unique to us and they can be used for identifying, right? So if you definitely, if you come to Singapore at the border, they will ask you to put your fingerprints and then they will identify you like that. So then the question is, can we also give fingerprints to integrated circuits like memory chips and CPUs? So that's the angle that we come from. And what we can do is we can build these fingerprints for devices. And the fingerprints are called physical unclonable functions. And the idea is that while we are making these integrated circuits, there are certain things that we cannot control. These are highly, highly regulated processes. The IC manufacturing process is very, very regulated, but still there are small variations that happen and they cannot be controlled. And as a result of these small variations, each IC is sort of unique, okay? And we can use these uniqueness in ICs to give them fingerprints, and then we can use these fingerprints for authenticating the integrated circuit. So let me walk you through. So this is a typical IC manufacturing process. So we will start off with a silicon substrate. And let's say there is, I want to make two wires on it. So I will put the masking film and this will ultimately become the two wires that I want to etch. I will put a photo resist on top. And then whatever circuit diagram I'm trying to etch, whatever two wires, I will keep them in the form of a mask, right? There are these two masks. And then I will shine ultraviolet rays on top. Wherever I put the mask, the ultraviolet rays will not be able to go through. But where there is no mask here, the rays will be able to go in, right? So then I will go through etching and stripping. And ultimately, I'll be left with these. 
right? So this is the basic idea. And uh, if you look at the actual masks, they would have very nice straight line features like this, 90 degree angles. But when I really complete the process, uh, the wires may not be exactly straight. There may be some curves at the, at the ends like this, the so ends are curved. And if you had designed this wire to be of a certain length, uh, there may be a little bit of variation in the length of the wire, right? And depending upon the technology, for example, if you take 130 nanom nan nanometer technology, if you're trying to make a gate, which is about 90 nanometers, usually there'll be a variation of about five nanometers. So, so quite a bit of variation, right? And then we use this to exploit this. So let, let me show you how we can, right? So the thing is the, the, the length of the wire determines the delay that, that, that's experienced. So let me show that to you. So let's take this very simple example where what I have is I have two rows of multiplexers. To each row, I give the same input bit as the selection. And these are what I call the challenge. Okay? And at the end here, I have a flip-flop. So now if you see the way the things are organized here, I'm giving the same input bit to each set of multiplexers. And this is my input signal that I'm giving to the multiplexers. So here I have given a input zero. So I'm going to select this input and this input. Here I have given zero, so I'll select this and this. Here I've given one, so I'm gonna... So at the end, uh, there is this blue path that's going to the multiplexer. And then there is this red path, which is going to the multiplexer. So the blue path and the red path, they're exactly identical. There is no difference, okay? So, so if I give a clock pulse here, they should arrive at the output exactly at the same time. There should not be any, any difference. But because of variations during my manufacturing, we cannot guarantee that all the wires will be of same length. So it may happen that this blue wire is a little bit shorter maybe one nanometer shorter than the red wire. So if the blue wire is shorter, then the blue path will be a little bit shorter, so the blue signal will reach quicker. So if the top path is faster, then my flip-flop here will register a one. But if by chance, this is totally uncontrolled, if this is a little bit longer than the short, lower path, then this signal will arrive first, and then I will get a zero. So whether I will get a zero or a one at the end is completely random and I have no control. Today I make this circuit, maybe the top path is faster. But if I repeat the same process tomorrow, I have no control over this and maybe the bottom path will be shorter. And then what I can do is I can have a number of these things in parallel. So instead of just getting one bit at the output, I can get a number of bits at the output. And this will be a random thing. And this part is essentially the fingerprint of the, of, the, of, the, of the device. So if I give a particular challenge, I will get a particular response out. And if I make the same circuit tomorrow and I give the same challenge, I will get a different response out. And this is the basic idea. If I give the same challenge to different circuits, identical circuit, but they were manufactured on different days or different times, the response will be completely different. So this is what is a physical and clonable function. And then what we can do is uh, we can go and build authentication protocols around it. And this is just an example of an authentication protocol. And what I have is I have a number of IoT devices and then they're trying to authenticate with a server. And each of these IoT devices will have a physical and clonable function. And what I will first do is I will give a challenge to this puff and see what is the response of that puff? And this challenge response pair, I will store with the server. So the server knows what is the initial challenge response pair. And now I can describe quickly what my authentication protocol would look like. So let's say IoT device A wants to authenticate itself. It will first send its ID and a randomly generated number called a nonce to the server. The server will say, okay, I, device A wants to authenticate. Let me see. 
what is the challenge and response pair for this device. Now it will generate a random number of its own and now it will give it, it will try to verify the identity of the device. So what it does is it encrypts the nonce that the device sent, the nonce that it generated and the ID of the device. It encrypts all of this, but to encrypt, it uses the response of the puff for that particular device. And then it sends the output. And the idea is that since only device A has the correct puff, if it uses this particular challenge with the puff, only device A should be able to get the correct response. Anybody else, if they use their puff and the same challenge, they will get a different response. So it will not work. Right? So this is what the device is doing. It's using the challenge, giving it to its puff, obtaining the response. And using that, it can decrypt the message and then it can generate the challenge and response for the next round. And then it will re-encrypt the message with, its, with, with the response and then send it back. And then the server can decrypt. And then if, if it realizes that the, the Mac is correct and so on, then it knows that uh, you know, the, 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 the authentication will then be complete. So I'm just giving you a very high level overview of what this can be. And then you can also go ahead and prove the security properties of this protocol uh, make uh, you know verify that nobody else will be able to get access to the to the to the challenge and response and things like that. And then what we have also done is we have taken this and and deployed it in a real system on chip. So we have deployed the puff. We have and we have made a real chip with the puff in there, uh, the crypto core which does all the encryption and decryption and so on. And then you know uh, for these devices, what you have is you have a trade-off between the security and the key size. If the size of your, if the number of bits in your challenge and response, if that's higher, then of course your security will be higher, you'll be more secure, but you will pay the price in terms of energy. And uh, the energy can be of two parts, the energy that you spend in the CPU and the energy that you send spend in sending and receiving messages. So both have a correlation with the uh, size of the challenge and response pair. So, so that's what we're showing here. Now, just before I conclude, I will just like to show that, you know, puffs are very promising, but there are certain issues also with puffs. One issue is that, you know, uh, I was talking about which wire is shorter. Now, the which wire is shorter here? So when a, when a device operates, it consumes energy and it heats up. So if it heats up, you know, thermodynamics says if you heat something up, they will expand. So if it expands, this wire will also expand, this wire will also expand. But they may not all expand uniformly. So previously, this may be the shorter one, but after expansion, this wire may become longer. So then your response will change. So that's not good for, uh, you know, if you're trying to build an authentication protocol, you want things to be constant always, but they have, so puffs can be sensitive to, to temperature and operating conditions. And more recently, what people have done is they have shown that, you know, they can launch machine learning attacks on puffs, and then they can predict responses to unknown challenges and so on. So uh, just to give a balanced view of, you know, puffs are very promising, or some challenges associated with puffs also. So that's sort of the conclusion of my talk. Uh, you know, IoT is, uh, has a, is very promising, but then there are security challenges. And uh, to solve those security challenges, we need a combined coordinated effort by different stakeholders. And there are many promising solutions and puffs happen to be one of them. And that's particularly one of the research interests that I personally have. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me and listening to my talk. And maybe if uh, anybody has questions, so we can get there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah. Biblo for his nice uh, presentations and for sharing a very informative session on IT and its security. So now the floor is open. I'd like to request the audience. So please, if you have any query, questions or comment, so please feel free to ask by unmuting your microphone. 